Um, so these three major, major traditions within system science are uh, confusingly, they go by different names and have different subvariants of them. We will be hitting respectively um, uh, on uh, system dynamics modeling, agent-based modeling, and discrete event modeling uh, within this discussion, bearing in mind that there are cognate traditions which use uh, uh, mathematically and, and formulaically uh, s s similar mechanisms, they, they use similar formalisms um, to depict the system that um, will go by different names. For example, with system dynamics, compartmental modeling um, is an extremely uh, venerable and esteemed tradition, um, uh, particularly well, um, uh, well represented and uh, um, uh, influential uh, for many, many decades, uh, basically a century within the infectious disease area, um, but uses models that are mathematically equivalent to system dynamics models, and, and, but it comes from a different sort of sociological, uh, different uh, tradition in terms of the, uh, uh, how the field originated. Agent-based modeling and microsimulation uh, are cognate traditions, uh, where microsimulation comes from two, two different traditions itself, and the social sciences, um, uh, as well as um, another tradition coming out of uh, more on the engineering side, um, uh, as well as agent-based modeling coming more from computer science, um, the work of von Neumann and Ulam. Um, discrete event simulation is yet uh, another technique that we will be touching on and which will play a prominent role in a number of our hybrid, uh, hybrid models. So I'm going to talk about these traditions um, uh, and methodologies more with a focus on their uh, perspective and contributions and formalisms, you know, cognizant of the fact that there are um, different sub-traditions um, that I'm not going to be able to do full justice to. System dynamics, as it is um, practiced under that name, is a feedback-oriented perspective that helps uh, describing, uh, conceptualizing, analyzing, and helping to manage, manage feedback systems. Um, it is a tradition um, in its own name, yeah? Oh, okay. Okay, but you can hear me. It's yes. just um, okay. With next volume, it's a whisper. Okay, can you see if you can? Um, uh, uh, actually, let me let me try this. Could you try it again? Yeah. Yeah. Try, try this. Can you hear me now? It's a quite significant delay. So I'll let me. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, I appreciate it. Um, system dynamics. Um, oh, that sounds better. Um, System dynamics uh, in uh, the form that uh, goes by that name originates in the work of Forrester in the 50s and uh, early 60s, what he termed uh, industrial dynamics. Um, it came out of work within, um, uh, within feedback control theory cybernetics. Um, and uh, it's a tradition notable in this discussion for having qualitative as well as quantitative components of it. There's a very strong systems thinking tradition that draws on ideas from system dynamics, but um, pursues them in semi-quantitative or qualitative tools such as causal loop diagrams and uh, a little bit more towards the quantitative side, system structure diagrams. Um, it's, a, it's a technique that has long emphasized the value of the modeling process not merely the model as an artifact to deliver value and, and engaging with stakeholders with representations such as causal loop diagrams very early that help, um, uh, that help inform um, stakeholder uh, awareness, understanding, um, uh, and, and help uh, shape their understanding of their different roles in a system from the very start of the modeling process, not merely waiting until a, a fully crafted model is available. Um, and as such, it, it tends to make use of mechanisms that speak to uh, participatory engagement with stakeholders, including somewhat simpler models, models which have fewer stocks and flows 
and that can be readily understood by those uh, in the system without having a background in, in, um, uh, in the underlying mathematics or the underlying modeling um, technique. At the same time, it has a, a rigorous um, and extremely versatile and rich mathematical foundation that allows us great insight with uh, appropriate uh, understanding and tools. Um, uh, and uh, as a result, there's a, a rich set of analysis approaches, which, for example, can help us identify in an evolving system which feedback loops are dominant or which uh, parameters have the biggest impact on the system, um, which areas of the model are shaping its current behavior in the most notable ways. Um, and there's some uh, quite sophisticated analytic tools that have come out of applied mathematics combined with system dynamics that are not tapped so much in participatory processes typically, but play a big role in, in, in shaping understanding of modelers as to system behavior. Um, and it has, to its credit, a variety of evolved software that really permits, uh, to a degree, stronger than ancient based modeling at this juncture. Um, for unfortunate reasons of history, um, uh, system dynamics is far ahead of, of agent-based modeling in terms of allowing us to describe declaratively um, the system we're characterizing. So it really allows a focus on what is being described rather than getting as much tied up in the details of how we represent it. The implementation of system dynamics models, the implementation phase, how we go beyond a design phase to, to actually implement them, to capture um, what we want it to do in, in the nitty gritty ways of how, um, that is, is vastly simpler than an age-based modeling and, and to a degree simpler even than, than discrete event simulation. A central theme within system dynamics um, and a theme to which much of the, of, of the practice and the practice um, in, in, that, that goes on returns is broadening overly restrictive mental models. System dynamics as a tradition tends to be much more about changing how people think about a system than delivering a model which is then viewed as, as you know, a trustworthy guide. It's, it's much more shifting our understanding of the system and shifting our behavior in the system in ways that we don't work across purposes with the system. We're not like King Canute ordering back the tide or, or you know, slamming our head into a brick wall fruitlessly. It, it helps us, as a tradition, focus on um, rethinking and reconceptualizing how our understanding of how the system behaves in ways that then change our habits of interacting with the system. And much of system dynamics is predicated on this idea of, of shifting mental models. And what this, what this means is that much of the tradition is, is focused on, on using tools that communicate to stakeholders from a diversity of backgrounds and broaden, broaden mental models. Um, and uh, you know, it seeks to broaden, uh, uh, to, to foster a broader understanding of the underlying system as articulated um, uh, in, a, in a large body of, of cognate work and systems thinking uh, by practitioners who span the divide, such as Peter Senge and the Fifth Discipline, if any of you are familiar with, uh, with his writings. Um, and this focus um, on feedbacks and focusing on broadening mental models to, to move beyond thinking just about in a narrow way about a system and, and viewing other things as kind of on the side, side effects, to really thinking about feedback centrally, about different pathways to effect, is motivated by the fact that feedbacks and multiple pathways to effect are, are fundamental factors in shaping our ability to effectively effect change, to, to achieve to, to use Jeff McDonald's term for it, fixes that stay fixed. Um, and system dynamics is, is a technique that seeks to change mental models, to build models, useful models that get used to put in place fixes that stay fixed. 
that where you're not merely putting in place a change that's going to be overwhelmed by some blowback or some knock-on effect to defeat it, um, so-called uh, uh, policy resistance. Um, and there's uh, dozens of examples that can be cited within the health sciences area, some of which are listed here, of um, policies launched from the best of intentions, but which went horribly awry or, or uh, were diluted or defeated um, and had much lower effect, at least compared to what they were hoping to, because of a failure to, um, um, uh, to, to appreciate these things. And I've cited a bunch of them there in, in brief form, but be aware that when I've said them, for example, cutting cigarette tar levels reduces cessation, um, uh, that's a blowback effect that, uh, you know, in the U.S., following the Surgeon General's report on the adverse health impacts of smoking, there was a, um, a lot of energy um, that was catalyzed around lowering cigarette tar levels. And the idea was, um, by lowering the tar levels of cigarettes, will uh, cigarette smokers will do less harm to their lungs, right? Um, they'll do less harm for secondhand smoke, although it wasn't as appreciated at that time. Um, because they'll be exposed to fewer carcinogens. And it was a well-meaning policy, but it ended up, uh, it's believed now by many tobacco experts who have done net harm. Net harm because, well, it, it did expose a given cigarette smoker, continued cigarette smoker, to, to less, um, less harmful carcinogens. Uh, it also probably led to a lot less people quitting smoking because they ended up switching to low tar cigarettes and, um, and did so instead potentially of, 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 of quitting. And it's believed a lot of people would have quit who instead stayed smokers thinking that they had a healthier option. And similarly with nicotine levels in another form and at another time, the push towards lowering cigarette nicotine levels with the idea being we'll get people less hooked you know, it was a nice idea, but it didn't take into account the feedback effects um, in terms of compensatory smoking. People whose cigarettes had less nicotine tended to smoke those cigarettes more fully or, or smoke additional cigarettes to get the same nicotine buzz to maintain that tolerance uh, for nicotine and avoid the craving. And probably, on balance, it led to, the, to net harm, actually more exposure to adverse uh, uh, to adverse um, uh, carcinogens as a result um, and um, uh, deleterious uh, impacts in the form of COPD or, or in terms of lung cancer, heart disease, etc. Um, so I commented in my previous presentation around that model this, this whole idea of shaping our mental models by using formal modeling artifacts not as crystal balls but as learning crutches or learning prostheses. These are tools um, in the form of, of formal models that we don't put all our faith in. Rather, we, we test them out as working hypotheses. We say, okay, you know, if this was the way it was in the world, what would the consequences be? To what degree does that jive with my knowledge from what system stakeholders tell us or what observations in the world has told us to what degree does that jive with my understanding of the world? And often we end up modifying this formal and modeling artifact in the form of system dynamics, the stock and flow model, um, based on this iteration. But then it also leads to uh, additional, often um, request to collect additional data from the world, undertake interventions, and compare them with what the model expected. So within this process, um, system dynamics allows us to articulate models at different levels of quantitation and to, um, to have simulatable models as well as models that are more um, uh, qualitative but allow us to communicate with stakeholders more effectively. Um, so system dynamics is notable for having a, a focus on feedbacks as fundamental shapers of behavior. Um, and, and our ability to manage your system. Feedbacks are not merely curious things. They're not merely things which whap us in the head when we don't think about them. They are fundamental shapers of how systems behave in the world. And, um, and if we don't take that into account, 
we will often um, uh, behave in ways that are entirely across purposes what's needed to achieve change that's sustainable in a system, those fixes that stay fixed. Um, it also focuses on accumulations. Now this may sound strange, but um, in system dynamics it's captured in terms of stocks and flows. And, and in compartmental model, let me talk about compartments, but the basic deal is we have accumulations that are associated with quantities that ebb and flow, and it takes a certain amount of time to drain them, uh, a certain amount of time to build them up, and hence they're associated with delays in inertia and disequilibria, et cetera. Um, uh, system dynamics has long emphasized our cognitive limits. You'll see it come through in my ways of describing things, but cognitive limits have been really an interesting way studied by system dynamics practitioners like John Sturman um, that, that demonstrates that, you know, absent a model, even the most quantitative amongst us, um, uh, often behaves in ways that that just run afoul of even very very descriptively simple complex systems. We 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 butt our heads against them in needless ways. We can't we can't control them or manage them effectively without quantitative help in the form of simulation models. Um, and um, system dynamics uh, also emphasizes uh, stakeholder participation. I mentioned that. At the same time, allowing models that are that are subject to formal formal reasoning, and it has uh, varied uh, applications at many different levels. Um, system dynamics uh, makes use of of different representations. Um, I'm not going to go into this as much, but it might be useful for tomorrow morning to be aware that there's this rich tradition of causal loop diagramming in system dynamics and in ways that are quite a slightly more quantitative in the form of system structure diagrams incorporating state, states and flows, stocks and flows. And within this context, we use a diagram which is uh, not far, formally fully quantitative. We can't run it, but we can use it to reason not only about the structure of a system in terms of feedbacks on your positive and negative, but we can use it as well to reason about how the system behavior we observe from the world might be resulting from certain interactions of feedbacks or particular feedbacks. So often we end up sketching out, mapping out a system. This is called model mapping. When we, before building a quantitative model, we build a, a semi-qualitative model of it that sort of helps us think through the different pieces of the system. And often we use that to have discussions with stakeholders and, and talk about their understanding of the system. Often people can understand this within minutes. Um, Peter Hoffman, who's a master practitioner of the art of uh, participatory modeling, talks about a story where they were working within uh, a village in India. Um, and it was a village um, that was beset by all sorts of social problems and, and and economic problems, uh, as well as environmental problems, um, that were tied up with the degradation of the environment. And he talks about how um, they were um, requested to engage with this village, their modeling team, by the village council, um, which um, was an all-male group. And um, there's uh, pictures of them, which I've in some of my presentations of this village council engaging with the modelers. But he talks about how they had a diagram of roughly this size up, and it was on the order of this size. And during the meeting, one of the um, one of the the spouses of one of the, the, the council members, a wife of one of the uh, of the council members, came by looking for her husband. She had heard that they're over with these foreigners doing some sort of discussion. And she came in and she, she, she didn't want to interrupt the flow, so she sort of sat there and she didn't know English. Um, uh, but fortunately things were written out in, um, in the, local, the local script and so on. And she looked at it for a few minutes and she actually came up to the diagram and said, no, you're missing something critical here. You're missing these links. You really need to, to add the fact that this was linked to this as well. Um, 
And that's why we saw this type of degradation, you know, when we were out cutting wood or what have you. And, and she pointed out a gap. And that's exactly what models are designed to do. They're designed to elicit understanding. And if a model, by being accessible to stakeholders, can invite critique and understanding, um, that's a huge advantage of the model. It's not a failure of the model, it's a success of modeling, right? And, and so these models can be used within minutes to invite understanding from uh, stakeholders that corrects our misperceptions as modelers. And often models like this are built up in a group uh, fashion. So Peter does a lot of work, for example, with high schools um, uh, or, or with community members you know, associated with uh, inner cities um, that are very effective. Um, now, when it comes to quantitative models, as we'll be exploring in this boot camp, um, there's two key building blocks in this monument, stocks and flows. Stocks represent accumulations. These collectively specify the state of the system. Um, and mathematically, we call them state variables, or they're known as compartments in the cognitive tradition of compartmental modeling. Um, uh, a given stock represents an accumulation that changes over time, but it changes only by virtue of its flow. It, it has some initial value in the model that it, it evolves from, but after that, it rises and falls based on the flows. If the flows into it exceed the flows out of it, it'll tend to rise over time. If the flows out exceed the flows in, it'll tend to fall over time. And you know, a key point we often use to say is something a stock or a flow, we ask, if we froze the system, like if right now we were to freeze time, um, uh, we would ask, can we measure the thing we're interested in? For example, an example of a stock would be the number of people in beds at the Royal University Hospital just across the way here, across the street. That's a stock, okay? It's the kind of people in those beds, I could go, I could freeze time, and I could in a ghostly way walk through there and count up the number of people, right, who are in beds. And and that's, that's a current aspect of the system. By contrast, flows, something like the number, of, the rate at which people are being admitted to university hospital per day, um, that's not a flow because I can't freeze time and, and measure. I have to measure over some period of time. And so stocks are things we can measure at, at a, a given instant in time. That's often a heuristic which we use. And they're shown as rectangles, so something like this. You know, stress, a current stress levels of blood pressure, allostatic load. Um, these might be things that we, we quantify as, as stocks. Um, and stocks determine uh, collectively the current state of the system. Um, and most disequilibria, cases where the system is out of balance, it's, it's really the stocks. It's why we have delays. It's why we have inertia. It's why we have disequilibrium. Uh, over time, or memory in a system, hysteresis. Um, and uh, stocks uh, are uh, a building block of fundamental character within system dynamics. The other building block at that level is flows. Um, and they go together. All changes to stocks occur because of flows. Um, the value of a stock rises if the inflows exceed the outflows and vice versa. Uh, it falls if the outflows exceed the inflows. Um, now flows, in contrast to stocks, are always expressed per unit time. Okay, so maybe it's people per day admitted to the hospital, or people per day in the population that, are, that pass away, or that are born, right? These are examples of flows. Whereas the total size of the population, that's a stock. We can count the number of people in the population at any time, but we can't count the number of people, you know, who have died, how quickly people are dying, the number of people per day who are dying, by count, you know, freezing time and going around and counting that. We have to count it over some period of time, because actually have a stock that accumulates it. So, um, so flows are often identified by saying, okay, can you, do you specify it in terms of something per unit time? Like, dollars per month, or persons per year, or, you know, choose your, choose your point in time, you know, meters per second, another example, right? Um, uh, and uh, as I noted, you typically measure it over a, a, a period of time. So flows within a system are shown at this kind of odd valve notation, 
Okay, the valve kind of indicates it can be more constrained or it can be at full throttle, you know, like full float rate of, of, of flow, right? Um, and we can have uh, a given stock has generally a set of inflows and a set of outflows. And to know whether the stock is gonna rise, we look at the net inflow. We sum up all the inflows and we sum up uh, and we subtract the sum of all the outflows. If that's greater than zero, it means water is coming in faster than it's leaving, so to speak. And it's like a bathtub, right? You have water coming in faster than it's leaving, the bathtub will, the water in the bathtub will tend to rise. If the water is going out, if it's going out at 10 meters a second, it's coming in five meters a second, um, uh, then, you know, it's gonna be dropping because it's flowing out faster than it's flowing in. Um, so, uh, stocks and flows go together. If flows flow into stocks and, and, and stocks values change because of flows. But the other side of it is, in general, flows, the value of a flow is going to depend on the value of the stocks. How many people are being discharged from that hospital on a given day is going to depend on something on the number of people in the hospital. There's no one in the hospital right now. Zero people. Um, no one's going to be discharged in the next day. Um, by contrast, uh, if there's you know 10,000 people in the hospital, chances are the number of people being discharged will be higher than if there's 100 people in the hospital. And so, in general, the value of flows depends on the value of stock um, from which they come, but other values as well. Um, so. So stocks, their evolution depends on the flows, but the, the value of the flows depend on the stocks, the current state of the system. Um, equally much so, if we look at for a nonlinear example, um, uh, my, the chance of my getting sick with flu um, depends a lot, not only on, on you know, the, the characteristics of my personal habits, but how many infectious people are around, right? It's that stock of infectious people, even though I'm, I'm currently susceptible, um, my chance of getting infected depends on the number of people around who are infectious. And so uh, it's not always just, it depends, the value of a flow depends on the stock it's coming from. It may depend on other stocks as well. So in general, Flows dictate changes in stocks. If the inflow is greater than the out, rate of inflow is greater than the rate of outflow, the stock will rise. And otherwise, you know, if they're equal, it will stay constant. If outflow is greater than inflow, it'll it'll fall. But stocks determine flows over time. Um, so you get this kind of um, uh, inter intertangling of them that makes system behavior quite uh, sophisticated. Um, and it turns out that the mathematics underlying these systems is well defined, well understood, well studied, um, and is subject to a lot of exquisitely beautiful methods um, that those who have the requisite mathematical background uh, can, can undertake. Um, you can study aspects of long-term behavior, the stability of the behavior to outside disturbance, you could look at possible forms of behavior, for example, oscillations, what feedback loops are dominating or lengths are dominating. Um, and it turns out this can be quite useful for machine learning methods um, as well that you can uh, take advantage of. And those who have been here since my previous boot camp on, on particle filtering and particle and CMC and machine learning tools, um, uh, will recognize there's some values in these sorts of models um, in that context. Um, so system dynamics is some really notable strength. It allows you to capture dynamics of continuous variables in, in very beautiful ways. For example, on the physiologic level, there's a whole canon of models that have been created by physiologists like Guyton and others, these quantitative physiologists, that really articulate theory as to bodily dynamics um, that, are, that are very well evidenced and, uh, and, and quite uh, rich in capturing feedbacks and accumulations related by, um, in closer form, uh, body weight models, models of body, body weight and composition, fat-free mass and fat mass. 
uh, very good models. Um, and continuous variables, um, in as much as we're characterizing ebb and flow of continuous variables, often system dynamics, uh, ordinary differential equation models, compartmental models, whatever name you go by, they're, they're often a, a tool of choice in describing these things. It allows for system dynamics as a traditional model for rapid model, model prototyping. I can often whip together a high level um, aggregate model quite quickly of, of given phenomenon. Um, and I can engage in participatory modeling with really well-defined scripts, uh, model mapping traditions that are that have whole books written about them and uh, and that can be easily depicted in a, in a terse way. Um, uh, it's, it allows declarative characterization that's really comparatively low dependence on computational skills. System dynamics modelers don't have to be programmers and, and, and a, in a classic sense. The truth is we can do this in age-based modeling. It's just the software is <laughs> it's not. It's not up to par um, uh, in doing this, but um, uh, but in system dynamics, it's been what we do for decades. Um, we use declarative models. We specify it in a visual way that doesn't require traditional um, uh, traditional computational um, um, programming. Um, and via formal analysis, we can uh, do uh, do a lot more more yet. Okay, so that's system dynamics modeling. Um, I'm a uh, strong uh, and uh, lasting practitioner of this. I, uh, I think there's many aspects of the tradition that are uh, to be learned from and to be applied regardless of what system science modeling tool you use. It's a rich tradition that, um, that offers uh, many, many strengths. Uh, uh, including many that can be translated to other domains. Okay. Um, uh, some of our work focuses on bringing the ease of declarative modeling from system dynamics over to, um, to agent-based modeling and hybrid modeling, for example. I'm now going to talk about agent-based models. Ladies and gentlemen, you were exposed earlier to a buzzing, blooming confusion of a model. We ran, we ran this model and a lot of things were appearing and there were these ovals and things moving around and maps and you know these kind of flashing charts of red and, and yellow and, and, and things moving up and down and buttons I was, I was clicking. I realized that that was probably a bit um, disorienting. But if I did it for a purpose um, uh, and uh, it's provided with point of reference from a model. And this model that we saw earlier was a hybrid model, but it was predominantly an agent-based model. It was sort of, um, it was, that was the main tradition used to articulate it. And agent-based models like that model um, are characterized by a set of features um, uh, that are listed here. We have one or more populations. There we had several populations. We had people most notably, but in a more passive way, we had populations of homes and populations of supermarkets, populations of parks, and more static sort of um, um, passive way. Um, and these populations are composed of individual agents. This is key to a, a defining feature of it. We're dealing with individual quantized agents, individuated agents. This isn't a tradition you would use to model a you know, an aqueous reservoir that holds cholera. You wouldn't do an agent-based model of, of, of um, drops of water in it. You know, it, it makes sense to apply it in areas where you have individuation, where you have individuals, whether it's vials of vaccine or, or most commonly autonomous individuals, individuals that engage in some behavior that um, is characteristic. Maybe it's clinicians and their patients. Maybe it's uh, service dogs and the veterans that they serve. Maybe it's uh, individuals in the population who use needles and not, and who are engaged in sexual transmission for HIV. So we have one or more populations of agents. Each is associated, each agent, this is important, is associated with parameters. These are some assumptions that are more or less fixed. Um, 
And very importantly, compared to system dynamics, where we, when we have characteristics of the population we stratify, we really need to use a discrete stratification. We need to divide it, say, into age groups. We can do so within, within uh, Asian base model, dividing into, say, people associated with an age group parameter or gender or ethnicity parameter. But often we make use of continuous parameters. For example, someone's birth weight, or their income, or the years of education, or aspects of their weight in a continuous way. So the point is, we can have continuous attributes of a person in contrast to a stratified system dynamics model where we're really limited to, without going to partial differential equations, we're limited to, um, to, to, to discrete or um, attributes. Um, by discrete, I mean countable number of possibilities, like age groups rather than age as a, as a continuous attribute. Um, beyond these fixed assumptions about agents, these things that don't change, we have state. We have each agent has a state. They carry around their state. We saw it earlier today. What what were the aspect? Can you mention one aspect of state that those agents had in that earlier buzzing, blooming confusion model? What was an aspect of their state? Yeah, okay, actually the preferences for the food, so that's a very important salient feature. Um, in that particular model dynamics we saw, we actually didn't change that. So it was actually, that was what I call a, a, a parameter. It is a property of the person, you're absolutely right, but it wasn't a, an aspect of their situation that was evolving over time. And that's often what we think of for state. Does anyone remember what was something that was evolving over time? And, and maybe they were a bit more plump when they were on that screen. What was that? The weight. The, their weight. Um, uh, and there were some ones that were less obvious uh, aspects of state. Their current behavior. Were they in the supermarket or in a store? Or they home? Um, there are other aspects too, like how many supermarket meals, how many you know bins of Tim Tams did they have in their larder, right? Um, uh, that, that was also uh, an aspect of their state. And in general, we might have continuous state um, or, or discrete state. So we might have weight, for example. We might have smoking status as a discrete measure. But maybe a smoking status including number of cigarettes you've ever smoked, cumulative pack years you've smoked, or how long you've been smoking. Um, uh, you know, it sense, or how long you've been quit, because maybe that's going to affect my chance of relapse you know, back to smoking. So we can capture these aspects of state very easily, including preferences, including networks um, as an aspect of state, who I'm connected with, with whom I'm connected, I must speak. Um, actions are another part. Uh, these are things that change state, that modify state. We have rules by which state is modified, like under what situations I start smoking or stop smoking. Maybe I stop smoking if I've access more easily to an e-cigarette, but that, that may keep me hooked to nicotine level, which might be a continuous attribute, which might lead to greater risk of relapsing in the future um, uh, on, a, on a convenient or uh, opportunistic basis. So actions are things that change the, and rules specify under what conditions the actions take place, okay? so under what conditions I will. So an action would be like starting smoking again or relapsing into smoking or quitting smoking. Whereas a rule might be under what conditions that takes place. Maybe it's a social interaction or a matter of craving, reaching a certain threshold stochastically, et cetera. And then there's some means of interaction. This is absolutely central in Asian-based modeling compared to micro-simulation modeling. Micro-simulation modeling is also articulated populations of agents, but it tends to downplay traditionally interaction with other agents. It tends to be more atomistic. We, we simulate this population of agents, and they go off and they evolve according to their life paths, and they, they eventually pass away, um, but we don't normally capture their interaction with other agents in a rich way. In agent-based modeling, often the biggest focus is on not just agents, but their interaction with each other, either directly or through the environment. Okay? Um, and we can have spatial environments, geographic environments, network-based environments. So here, 
we're going to be looking at dynamics not only over time, like in system dynamics, but over space, over networks. For example, the spread of gonorrhea over a network, or a spread of HIV over a, a sexual network, and separately an IDU network of any brain drug use. Beyond that, we have time horizons and characteristics in initial state. Okay? Um, so I want to emphasize this point. Um, when it comes to aggregate stock and flow models, which are the most common sort you'll see of system dynamics models around, um, there's a big difference between how we organize agent-based models and aggregate models in system dynamics. And this is a, a very important point that it can take, it, it can be hard for people to wrap their heads around it. So forgive me if it's obvious to you, because it probably won't be to most people in the room. And time was, it wasn't obvious to me intuitively. In system dynamics, we typically divide an aggregate model, an aggregate model, we divide up the population according to their state, or their characteristics. We, for example, we might have uh, people divided according to their, their state, their, their current natural history of infection. They're susceptible or exposed or infected or recovered. Okay? And people might go from one of these compartments to the other. Each compartment counts the number of people who are in that compartment. Okay? the number of people who are susceptible, the number of people who are exposed, and over time, through infection, we might have someone getting infected and flowing to exposed, and then they complete a latent period and they become outright infective, for example. So here we're subdividing the model according to state, and each stock counts. The data we're keeping track of is how many people are there in each state. This is true for these aspects of state, you know, as someone's state changes. I, I become infected, my state goes from susceptible to exposed. And so, you know, maybe there were a thousand people here, I was one of them, and when I get infected, this goes down to 999, and this goes up, you know, it gets incremented, I, I, I sort of um, float over there. In fact, we don't track individuals here. It gives a cross-sectional depiction of the population. At any one time, we get a count of people, and each of these stocks, but we don't get a, um, we can't track an individual's history, okay? Um, so here, we subdivide it according to state, and each stock counts the number of people. But I would further say we subdivide it according to characteristics, according to other things like their gender, their, their aspects of their, what we call parameters for agents, the things that don't change. For example, susceptible men, susceptible women exposed men, exposed women. If we want to keep track of women and men, maybe because of differential uh, asymptomatic rates or different uh, care-seeking behavior associated with men versus women, um, we could do so, but, but we'd actually need to divide the model up so we'd have like susceptible men, susceptible women, exposed and exposed women, infected men, infected women. We need to, again, we need to create a separate stock, a separate accumulation to represent things that differ according to state or differ according to other characteristics. This is an aspect of an aggregate system dynamics model. Now, by contrast with, um, with agent-based modeling, we have it kind of flipped on its head. Here, um, within a given unit, like, a, like so let's say a city, we, we, would, we would have a, a population um, which is divided up. The model is not subdivided according to state or other characteristics. It's subdivided according to people. So we have individual people. That's the unit of organization. That's the sort of quantum. That's the, that's the kind of way in which the model is organized. It's sorted into different people. And each person, where in system dynamics, each stock counted the number of people with that characteristic or in that state. Here in agent-based modeling, each person keeps track of their current state, their, their characteristics, whether they're male or female, and, you know, what age they are, um, whether they're currently susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. So each person keeps track of its own, um, its own uh, situation and its own characteristics, okay? Um, and it turns out that, that within Asian-based modeling, we have this very nice nesting of the model. In other words, um, if we have a, 
if we have a situation where we have a region and the region is divided into cities and each city is divided into neighborhoods and each neighborhood um, has people in it, we can actually have a model that mirrors that. So we have a region and then we have cities, a population of cities within regions and neighborhoods within each city, et cetera. Within system dynamics models, we tend to, to not have uh, the ability to nest things. It's all kind of on one flat, flat, flat level. Um, and so we have stocks for different cities maybe alongside each other. So this might be the population for Newark and there's another one susceptible to New York City or what have you. Um, okay, so models, uh, agent-based models, we have this population. When we run the model, so in the model, we might have one population, but it's composed of many people. And when we run the model, well, each of those people is individuated there. They form this population when we run it, and they interact. We saw that earlier with the Weebles, like those on Christine's desk. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they know about Weebles. I think they may be too young for that. Yeah, um, I bet you remember it. Yeah, um, they don't fall down. Yeah, hopefully like the instructor. Yeah, um, so um, each person in the model might be associated with a certain set of characteristics. Do you remember we saw this earlier with that model we were working with? Each person had a, a, a degree of hankering, a predilection for, for a convenience store meals. Do you remember that? Um, and each person also was associated, it turns out, with a home. They had, they had a home. Um, so if we in the model have a theory of personhood, say, where we have ethnicity, sex, and income, what that means is when we run the model, we have a population of people, each of whom has a particular, uh, particular ethnicity, particular sex, and particular income. It differs from person to person, but while the heterogeneous population in a rich way. And this is what I mean by a continuous attribute. They can have, they're not restricted to having income quintiles or something. They can have a, have a continuous attribute according to their, their characteristics. They can have state and in general will have uh, multiple lines of state uh, associated with the person. So we might have multiple concerns. There might be concerns related to their care seeking behavior and to their infection and a person will be in exactly one state with respect to their infection at a given time. Maybe they're infective. But with respect to care seeking, they'll be in a certain state there. They're open to care seeking or they're not open to care seeking um, uh, here. So the point is we can have multiple concerns for a person, each say associated with, with some aspect of state here, a, a state chart. And they can evolve over time with respect to, um, to those. Now, You'll notice when I highlighted this here, um, I, I highlighted state as well as rules for evolving state, and then and I could have further highlighted actions. The point is, when we have this sort of situation, this this is a depiction that, incidentally, like the stock like the stock and flow uh, characterization, it specifies the state, the possible states they can be in with this concern, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. At any one time, I'm in one of these states as a person. And these arrows represent actions that change the state. So I can go from exposed to infected as I emerge from a latent period. Um, or I can, uh, for example, uh, lose immunity and go back to a susceptible. Those are actions. These associated with these transitions, these, these represent actions that, in as much as they change the state. And you'll notice these little, these little icons on them, those are not merely put there for fun. Um, uh, they are put there because they illustrate the rule, type of rule by which this action fires. So for example, going back from recovered to susceptible, this is an action which is characterized by a hazard rate. There's a certain chance per day that I'll I'll become susceptible again to chlamydia. Um, and, um, and here, uh, for example, this, um, uh, this uh, time up transition, this, this would indicate after a certain, certain amount of time, exactly, I will go from the infective state to the recovered state. I'll, I'll, I'll um, you know, get over this illness, I'll, I'll recover from it. Um, 
Alternatively, this one, this, this one shown as a, as a little envelope, that indicates there's some circumstance where, as we say, asynchronously, something else in the model could say, thou art now recovered. Okay, so maybe they treat me, they treat me for chlamydia, and and I recover from chlamydia because of that treatment. They give me, you know, uh, antibiotic treatment in the STI center, and I recover from chlamydia. Um, don't tell people. Um, you know, I, I recover from it, right? Um, and this is something is done to me, and so this is called a message transition. Someone sends me a message and say, "You are now recovered." Go and teach your course, Professor Osgood. Um, so, um, so that's uh, a state chart. Whether it's individually or together, bundles together aspects of state with respect to a concern, aspects of actions as it relates to that state for that concern, and rules by which those actions fire. Situations under which, for example, they'll transition from infected to recovered or exposed to infected, etc. There's some other features of this that we'll learn about later, like branching transitions, maybe, for example, if I'm exposed, I'm not, if, if, I, if I get exposed to the bug, I'm not automatically infected, so sometimes I'll, you know, I, I, uh, I'll get exposed, but I, I won't actually cause infection. There's some of these self-transitions, we'll get to that, but broadly speaking, this is uh, an aspect of it you should understand. And one of the key aspects of agent-based modeling, I argue, and I'm keenly aware of I'm between you and lunch, um, uh, is, is um, uh, one of the, the key components of agent-based modeling, arguably the defining component historically, has been the interest in interaction of agents. How does emergent behavior of the model reflect not just ad, uh, agents as atoms, as these kind of uh, individuated um, grains of sand, but rather, how does interaction between agents directly or through environments contribute to, um, uh, contribute to uh, dynamics of the model, the, the emergent behavior of the model? And often that's carried out through networks. As we'll see in any logic, we can have multiple networks at the same time, say intravenous drug use networks, uh, networks associated with sexual contact, and uh, perhaps um, uh, you know, transfusions uh, is all generative pathways by which HIV can be transmitted to an individual, for example. Okay? Um, and ABMs, um, like with system dynamics models, we see emergent behavior. Um, the whole for these models is often greater than some of the parts. That's what system science is about. It's the system, it's the, it's the science of the whole. It's the science of systems where the whole is different than the sum of the parts, where you can't reduce it to the sum of the parts, which are often systems characterized by nonlinearity and a mathematical level. Um, but in system dynamics and in, and in discrete event simulation and in agent-based modeling, we all see emergence. What's a defining feature in agent-based modeling is you see these phenomena of emergence often not only over time, like we do in agent-based modeling, or sorry, system dynamics modeling. In agent-based modeling, we see it also, for example, over space or for networks. So we can see, for example, patterns of emergent behavior in terms of deposition of pathogen, in this case, prions, as deposited by deer, um, shown as the agents who are dropping uh, prions in an environment um, that then builds up uh, these stalks of these long-lasting misfolded proteins called prions. Um, and here, we have emergent behavior over time with respect to size of the populations involved, um, but we also have, you know, due to death rates, due to uh, prion-induced disease, chronic wasting disease, but we also have emergent behavior when it comes to the uh, patterns of deposition, okay? Um, and sometimes these patterns can be quite um, surprising. You get uh, patterns that are, are quite different from what you expect by looking at the model just as within, you know, system dynamics will be surprised by patterns over time from interacting feedbacks. Here we'll be surprised by spatial patterns as well as patterns over time. Um, 
Um, okay, um, HMA's modeling differs from most system dynamics models by being stochastic. Uh, in system dynamics, we take a certain defined, as George Richardson put it, defined distance from the underlying system. We try not to get involved in an aggregate system dynamics model traditionally in the, the, the events of the system. We try to capture broad patterns of change. By contrast, AVMs are typically stochastic. We're dealing with things at an individual level when it th comes to things like infection at an individual level or recovery, when it comes to things such as contact patterns. Stochastics are prominent. We, we, we're not going to get around to it. And as a result, when we run the model, we'll get, for different runs, um, we typically run them with different, as we say, random number seeds, we'll get somewhat different results. And to make sure that the results and our conclusions about them are not merely flukes, to make sure that they're, we're drawing, you know, um, uh, well-grounded well conclusions, typically we run a model, as we say, in an ensemble. We run it many times. We run it again and again and again. And we make sure that we understand the patterns from it, not just on the basis of one run, but of the whole, the whole en en ensemble. Um, I will note that stochastics are not merely um, liabilities that force us to run it many times, things we just have to deal with. They are assets. They help us explain patterns of variability seen in the world. So a given run might yield particular outcomes, particular trajectories on some overall outcome measures. But if you run it many times in this ensemble and you summarize the results across these, you may see where, where in any given run you get one number out of the cumulative number of cases of infection in high SES areas versus low SES areas. If you run it many, many times, you'll get distributions out. It won't just be one result of cumulative number of cases, but instead you get a distribution. Some runs have, have more cumulative cases. Those are the, the, the magenta ones over there on the, the right-hand side, and some have fewer. Um, uh, and, and we may see over time a distribution of outcomes. Um, and by putting into place, say, uh, an intervention, you'll see changes in those emergent distributions, those patterns of association. The final um, technique I'll talk about, and then we'll break for lunch here, is discrete event simulation. Discrete event simulation um, uh, is a technique that, like system dynamics, goes back to the mid-century, um, mid-20th century, um, the work of Tocher. Um, undertaken, like Forrester's industrial dynamics, at a, but at a lower level, in an industrial setting, well, like both of them. Um, it focuses on resource-constrained um, workflows, structured workflows, uh, that where often our interest lies in the progression of agents called entities through the system, and where outputs of interest often include quality measures as well as um, uh, you know, prominently things such as waiting times, waiting lengths of time waiting, throughput, how many, how many patients we can treat per hour, for example, uh, within a system, um, and, um, and aspects of resource use. So you know, what fraction of the time are the nurses working as compared to it being in the nurse's lounge? Um, so uh, here we're often dealing with queues, queues waiting for certain resources. Um, there's entities that flow through the system, these agents at an individual level, they're flowing through the system, and they're either processed or kept waiting because the resource is not available. Generally, the progress through the system depends on availability of resources, such as the availability of an x-ray machine, a CAT scan, or a VQ scan for, for um, examination associated with, um, uh, with other aspects of, of uh, pulmonary embolisms um, or ultrasound scan. And uh, there's capacitated resource limits that limit you know, just how many CAT scan devices are available or MRIs. And so people are kept waiting in response to that. So discrete event simulation has a number, it's an ex has a number of strengths. It's an exquisite tool for describing um, 
the dynamics of structured workflows in the context of limited resources. Um, and it's the capacity to identify how changes in the level of resourcing, the, uh, the coordination of resources, the placement physically of resources in the layout of the facility affect waiting times and uh, number of people that can be served at a certain level of quality per day uh, by a facility. So it's, it, it really um, prioritizes and, um, and emphasizes uh, resources and their impact on a system. It's also characterized by comparatively lower reliance on computational skills. So this is an example of the discrete event diagram, which uh, has been provided to you, I believe, but certainly something I'm glad to share, but basically it involves people flowing through an emergency department um, and waiting for beds, for example, being examined, waiting for a clinician to examine them, um, waiting for a diagnosis or an imaging modality such as an x-ray machine, etc., cetera, um, an x-ray room. So these structured workflows involving service delivery are prime tools for use of techniques like this. Um, and within the context of this boot camp, we will be using this as a tool of choice when it comes to depicting um, uh, service delivery for individuals who present for care at, say, clinics in response to drawing ill. Um, but it can just as easily be used to you know, simulate uh, the flow of uh, veterinary patients or a veterinary, um, uh, veterinary care context. Um, it can be used to examine applications for social services and their flow as they need to go through multiple levels of examination. Or indeed, the flow of individuals through the court system or through, the, um, uh, through corrections facilities. Okay? So discrete event simulation is exquisitely concise, expressive, and um, convenient when we have structured, resource limited workflows where we're interested in understanding the, the service uh, outcomes of the, of the flow of individuals through there and interested in understanding how resources impacted and what that, um, that flow, uh, how that impacts utilization of resources within a facility. Um, and we'll be returning to this again and again for a number of hybrid models involving particularly care seeking. Okay, um, so um, I've spoken about care seeking and I would suggest that we now engage in food seeking behavior. Um, and to that end, Christine, who's a, a master of things behind the scenes here, has um, arranged a, uh, a very, uh, a very uh, convenient system for us. So you'll find in your badge tags that beyond your Wi-Fi login and login to these machines in the room, you'll find that just behind your name, there's a little card. There's, in fact, a set of cards, and these cards are individuated by day. Um, so each card is a stamped day on it, okay? Um, so, for example, this one uh, is August 19th. Um, and uh, these cards, uh, when you go over, the students will lead you over to Marcus Hall, um, which is uh, just a hop, skip, and a jump from here and up some stairs. Um, you'll present these at the point of entry to the clerk who takes, um, uh, who, who normally takes payment. You'll just give this to her and she'll let you in. And then you can serve yourself from any number of buffet stations there. You can return to that, um, to that area to get seconds or thirds or, well, you can follow your imagination. Um, uh, and just be aware there's a wide variety of stations so you might want to check it out. There is food there for people from a wide variety of, of, of different dietary needs and culinary traditions. So uh, you should be able to, to find yourself um, suitable nourishment. Uh, we'll come back here um, in an hour and I'll ask the students to, um, uh, to make sure that uh, people are aware um, uh, when that uh, time passes so that um, they, can, they can signal when we'll be returning, okay? 
And uh, I'll look forward to joining you on some future days. Uh, today, I need to uh, have some personal business to attend to, but um, uh, the students should, uh, should be able to uh, put you in good stead. Thanks very much, and we'll see you in an hour's time. Jason, is that coming through? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I believe the room will be locked. The room will be locked. And, and in fact, it will be under guard. Yes. So we can leave all your stuff. You can leave, you can leave all, your, all your possessions here. Um, and I'll, I'll be watching out for it. Let me get this. Uh... <laughs>